Uh, I'm Mark Silverstone. I'm an associate professor here at the Miller Center, and I chair its Presidential Recordings Program, uh, one of the flagship uh, academic programs that we run here at the Miller Center. Miller Center, for those who don't know, uh, is in um, kind of an independent uh, think tank that's part of UVA. We struggle to actually figure out how to describe us. Are we a think tank? Are we a research center? Um, but uh, we have been using think tank terminology, uh, but we uh, have been going, uh, a going concern at UVA since 1975, uh, and we focus on politics, history, uh, and policy uh, issues with a special emphasis on the presidency. And most recently, we have become very involved in UVA efforts uh, centered around topics of democracy and, uh, and essentially the, 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 the fate of the political system. Um, this has been a, a concern of UVA's for a while, but uh, several years ago, University started a democracy initiative, and that uh, incorporated elements throughout the university, Miller Center among them, uh, and most recently, those have been rolled into a much more substantial and uh, long-standing Karsh Institute of Democracy, well-funded, uh, that draws from a lot of units at the university, uh, focusing on the fate of democracy, not only uh, at home, but also abroad. And uh, the center has been an active player in a lot of those, uh, a lot of those activities. A couple of years ago, we started holding what we call these democracy biennials. The first one was in 2019, and it was held for those of you who know the, the university over in, in old uh, uh, Cabell Hall, uh, and featured President Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton, as the keynote speaker. And it was our intention to continue on with these democracy biennials into the future. And so the most recent one that we held was in the fall of 2021. And it was in conjunction with that event that we wanted to take the fruits of our conversation, which was uh, robust and, um, and I think quite uh, enlightening and illuminate, illuminating for a lot of people who participate and see how we could roll that into some type of educational uh, opportunity for teachers in Virginia, for students in Virginia. And so we decided to create UVA's Democracy Biennial Fellows Program. And uh, what we're doing today, this workshop, is a core component of that program. Uh, we have been working for the past year or so with five select teachers from around Virginia to develop curriculum based upon several themes that came out of the most recent Democracy Biennial. And I'll just tick those themes off for you so you know generally where, where we're headed. The first is Democracy and Capitalism, in which we were looking at issues of inequality, opportunity, uh, the future of work, uh, urban revitalization, and globalization, so kind of really big ticket themes uh, that are important. Um, and given, given the salience really of capitalism, um, more so in the academy these days, there's a lot of work being done on the history of capitalism, on the future of capitalism. Its intersection with democracy we thought was really important to explore. A second major theme for this democracy biennial, the most recent one, was mobility, equity, and the American dream. Uh, in which we were looking at the distance that we uh, as a people have traveled, uh, as well as the distance that we still have to go uh, to expand opportunities for people to realize the American dream. So that was the second theme. And the third theme was on the future of democracy itself, in which we looked at the various institutions of democracy, how well they're functioning, the powers of those institutions, are they strong, are they weak, should they be stronger, should they be weaker, uh, and the challenges, uh, particularly given uh, the last half decade or plus, really, even of, of looking at the norms and the institutions and their health and trying to figure out where we go from here. So uh, 
We, um, myself and Stephanie George Akis Abbott, who will be here this afternoon, uh, worked with our five biennial teacher fellows to develop curriculum units that were informed by those themes from the Democracy Biennial. I just want to introduce our, our Democracy fellows right now because you'll be working with them later on in the day in the breakout sessions. Uh, Clooney Brown from Chesterfield High School. Clooney has developed curriculum materials on the American dream. Uh, Kimberly Dove from Wilbur Pence uh, Middle School in Dayton. Uh, Kim has uh, developed materials uh, on the broad theme of governing America, key institutions and facets um, that we'll all recognize. Uh, Alan Robinson from, Alan K. Robinson, excuse me, from uh, Charlottesville High School. Alan uh, was developing materials centered around the theme of living democratically. Uh, Joe Service uh, in front here from Appomattox High School. Uh, Joe's worked on the presidency uh, through time, so exploring the way that the presidency has evolved and its powers uh, throughout our close to um, what we're, we're coming up on. Well, 250 years since 1776 coming up on, but obviously the presidency is a little bit younger than that. Uh, and then Tina Takich uh, from Mark Twain, formerly from Mark Twain Middle School, uh, who is now working uh, directly in curriculum development and also getting her uh, EDD from, from UVA. Um, uh, Tina uh, developed materials on the theme of civil rights, uh, responsibilities, and opportunities. So. Uh, Later on this morning, as well as this afternoon, we'll break into uh, individual sessions uh, and we'll explore the materials that, that the teachers have developed. You'll have an opportunity to provide some real-time feedback and then we'll talk some more at the end of the day about uh, digital feedback that you can provide uh, as well. In addition to using this workshop as an opportunity to provide that feedback to these teachers, because we've been working on these materials now since um, in one form or another since, since last fall. We also wanted to engage you uh, in a conversation about some of these themes, and particularly about the themes of uh, educating for democracy, and particularly in a fractious time uh, such as we are in now. So um, uh, we're gonna start off this morning with that conversation that I'll introduce in a minute, but before I go any further, I just wanna um, extend some thank yous for people who have uh, made today possible. First off, to uh, Victor Luftig and Becky Yancey and Natsuko Rodi from the Center for the Liberal Arts and the Arthur Viney Davis Foundations. That we're, um, uh, we're very grateful for the support of, of our, our partners in this event. Uh, to the Miller Center for its support and to Mike Greco, to Dan Haller and to Rob Canavari for helping to stage the event. They've done a fabulous job, uh, as they always do. Uh, to Reed Forbes, who has helped out with all of the uh, on-site uh, and some off-site um, logistics as well. Uh, you may see Reed buzzing in here throughout the day. I'm hoping that Reed's um, golden retriever, Stella, can make an appearance as well. She's downstairs. <laughs> That'll be fun. And then my co-collaborators, uh, Stephanie Georgiakis Abbott and Alfred Reeves IV, uh, who have been integral to, to making this happen, uh, put in a lot of hard work uh, and, and a lot of hours on this, and we're really excited to be with you here today. To start off, we're gonna have that conversation about education uh, and democracy, and um, it's an important one to have, uh, as I mentioned, especially given the times that we're in, uh, we're, we're just a, a couple weeks away from the midterm elections, uh, which are proving to be uh, pretty uh, fraught, uh, as, as we can all see on the television from the, uh, the advertisements that we're, um, we're watching. Um, we're also obviously grappling with the fallout still from uh, the events of January 6th, uh, 2021, uh, and not just those events, but the long trail that led up to those events and the challenges that they pose to the health of our democracy. Uh, and here in Virginia, uh, we saw that uh, issues surrounding race and history and politics were very much at the center of the most recent governor's race. Uh, and those dynamics continue to inform the way that we operate in our classrooms. And so as part of an effort to help you think 
uh, through the challenges of addressing some really um, hot button issues uh, uh, at this particular time and going forward, we wanted to engage some specialists uh, in the field. And uh, we have invited Paula McAvoy, who is Associate Professor of Social Studies Education, Teacher Education, and Learning Sciences at North Carolina State uh, University, to be with us today to help us think this through. Paul is really an expert at uh, interpreting the relationships between uh, schools and democratic society. Uh, she has written widely on this, particularly in her award-winning The Political Classroom, Evidence and Ethics in Democratic Education. She's particularly interested in helping us figure out how to prepare young people for a living in a non-ideal democratic society, society and, for, um, and for helping facilitate um, our conversation about controversial issues in the classroom. Uh, engaging Paula in conversation is Neely Minton, who uh, is a social studies lead coach uh, for K-12 uh, in the Albemarle County public school system, uh, having previously held a similar position in the Charlottesville City public schools. Uh, Neely is also expert in addressing these issues. Uh, she founded the K-12 Changing the Narrative Initiative, which is designed to help teachers explore the roots of current inequities and implement anti-racist and anti-bias instruction. Uh, and she has years of experience in the classroom teaching both uh, U.S. history and world history in the Albemarle County Public Schools. So I'd like to invite Neely up onto the stage and Paula will be joining us uh, remotely uh, via Zoom uh, and we'll have a conversation. We'll go for about 45 minutes. Neely and, and Paula will in, in, engage in conversation for about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, and then we'll open up to a Q&A. So Neely. Take it away, Paula, welcome. All right, make sure this is working. Can y'all hear me okay, the mic's working? All right, great, and I'm assuming, is Paula on? I can see you, can you hear me? <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Mark, uh, for you inviting me to this uh, event today. It's good to meet with all of you today and have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to seeing the curriculum um, and units that you all produce because I think that will benefit uh, students and teachers across our state. So thank you for your work um, through this fellowship. So. I'm going to start off um, kind of broad with Dr. McAvoy, and Dr. McAvoy, it's good to see you um, in this conversation, but let's start just at the beginning a little bit. Um, Dr. Can I just, mm -hmm. uh, do we have sound audio for uh, Paula before we start? Okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> ask a question to the air. Well, <laughs> if all else fails, we can have a conversation with folks here, so. Mentioned that as we were, this is an outtake of the 2021 
So we have audio. Okay, great. So let's let's do that. All right. Uh, have the audio conversation. Yeah. No worries. Uh, we. Hey everyone. We'll pretend like it's a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this will be our own podcast episode <laughs> uh, that we're recording from here. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's nice to hear you, uh, Dr. McAvoy. Um, I would love for us to kind of start at the beginning um, with a sort of an opening, broad question. Um, and I know you have a lot of experience in this area and you've done a lot of research. So in your mind, Dr. McAvoy, what does it mean when we say educate for democracy? Yeah, thank you. And uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for letting me be here and joining with you today. Um, educating for democracy, I think, involves kind of three main buckets of uh, it's the cultivation of the values, skills, and dispositions to participate in democratic life. And uh, the values involve uh, young people understanding what are the founding principles uh, of our particular democracy, how have those principles changed in interpretation over time, how have we in what ways not lived up to those principles, and where do we have room for growth and development. Um, and so it's a deep understanding of the history and the values uh, that, that we're um, trying to promote within this particular society. And an understanding that it's, as I said, it's always in development, that we're not, that democracy is not something stagnant, but something alive and changing. Um, and then with related to that are um, particular skills. These involve um, everything from knowing how to vote, when to vote, um, how what your rights are as a citizen and um, the ways in which you can engage from the local level on up to the federal level, um, how to interpret news and information and make informed decisions, how to weigh evidence, give reasons, um, all of these sorts. Oh, here I am. Um, there you are. <laughs> um, and then one area of my research is particularly on the skill of discussion. And so that one thing that democracies rely upon is that we can you know, the very idea of democracy is the belief that people can work together to solve the issues that matter to them. And so that requires us to listen to one another, give reasons to one another, care about one another's position in the world. So it can't just be a self-interested um, view of democracy that we need to think about. How do we reason sort of in, 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 at, at times for a collective good, for the what, what is the well, what is the well-being of the country? Um, versus just what's right for you as an individual. And so we have to always be weighing those things. And that's a complicated skill as well. And so discussion is one way that we can broaden young people's understanding of how people are differently positioned in the world, how people interpret uh, and experience the consequences of the policies we pass differently, um, and help them form their own decisions about how they want to, um, you know, what they want to advocate for. Um, and then the skills of so there's working together and then there's the skills of advocacy. So what are the issues you care about? Um, how can I put them forth in the world? How do I, um, you know, how do I help us move in a, in a direction that is for the benefit of everyone? And then that's related to the last bucket, which is dispositions. So uh, we don't only want people to know what the principles are, but we want them to have um, a willingness to engage, a willingness to uh, at the minimum vote, but uh, be be follow, be people who follow the news, be people who are curious about their neighbors, be people who are willing to uh, help when necessary, natural from natural disasters to community needs. 
Um, and so the disposition to, and a disposition to protect the democracy, right? So right now we're living in a time in which the very question, do we want a democracy is on the table, right? So there are forces in the country that want us to move away from democracy. And right now I think it's just incredibly important that schools are really taking a big step back with young people and saying, let's, let's see if these are the values we want and figure, you know, to help them really deeply um, you know, that, you know, uh, feel the desperate, feel not the feel the desperation, but feel the urgency of um, that things are under threat. And just like climate change um, is a threat to the planet, there are threats to the democratic system right now. And so we need to be attentive to that. Thank you so much. You, you gave me a lot to think about. I was jotting down some notes while you um, identified all of the buckets that fall under educating for democracy. I think two thing, two threads I pulled out from uh, your response to that question were, um, that stood out to me in particular, were about facilitating conversations and discussions with students, especially in, um, you didn't say this, but I know you have done a lot of research in this area, but especially in a hyper-polarized um, climate that we're in <laughs> right now. Um, and then you also pulled out the thread of kind of encouraging students to be citizens, to take interest in issues and to take action around those issues and to practice those skills of citizenship. So if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd love to dive into the first thread first um, around uh, facilitating conversations with students. So in this hyper-polarized environment that we're in um, and an environment where we have non-ideal um, conditions, in some ways, how can teachers um, how can teachers navigate that? How can they encourage students to learn from each other, to listen to viewpoints that are different than their own, and and kind of just to navigate those conversations in the hyperpolarized environment that we're in? Yeah, yeah, this is hard. It's obviously hard and getting harder, right? So that we. Um, there's a lot of pressure on schools right now to avoid controversial issues or avoid political issues. Um, and I, you know, I feel strongly that uh, if schools move in this direction and if teachers follow the push, <laughs> that you're actually contributing to the demise of democracy. So we need to make sure that we are committing to uh, holding the line that it is the reason schools were created <laughs> was to help support and maintain a democracy. And so we need to um, hold on to that. Um, but to your point, so, ha but I understand it is hard. You, you know, people, teachers are getting pressure from parents, from administrators, from governors, <laughs> from, uh, from every, from all angles to do something called stay neutral and just teach facts. Um, but I think that clarifying, so one uh, important, starting point for the question, how should we engage students in discussions of political issues, is to get clarity on what discussion is. And a lot of people use the term discussion to just mean uh, included in the curriculum. So in my class, we're, we're in the next semester, we're discussing World War II, uh, the Cold War, blah, blah, blah. And that doesn't, and you could do that and students could never open their mouths, right? It could be that the teacher is just lecturing on that every single day. So discussion, I wanna just clarify, is not include in the curriculum. It's, I don't mean that when I say discussion. When I say discussion, I mean a more student-centered approach to discussing issues in which the teacher is structuring activities in which then giving students materials and preparation so that they are actually discussing with one another. So it's designing the classroom so that the teacher is a facilitator um, and is, is kind of the, the orchestrator of the discussion. Um, and it's not what we see a lot of times in the classroom is that when students do talk, it's generally always to the teacher. So there's lots of things that get counted as discussion that just go student, teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher. Um, and what we, and that's fine at times to do that. It's not that you should never do it. But when you're having discussion, what you're designing for is that students are giving reasons and evidence and expressing their values to one another. Uh, and this can be anything. It can be a simple, you know, and it should be scaffolded. And we need to teach students how to do this. So students all know how to talk. They don't all know how to have a classroom discussion. And so we need to help teachers to 
scaffold for students how these things happen. And so simple turn and talk about public issue is the is a building block for having discussion. Small group discussions well structured um, is a is a good way to get a lot of voices in the room. You know, so that's the the teacher student teacher student talk, there's always one person talking. <laughs> uh, you get a, a vibrant small group discussion. You've got lots of voices getting to talk at the same time. And there's and then you can move towards whole class. And I think a lot of people think the good discussion or the ideal discussion is some magical whole class seminar style discussion in which everyone's listening and working together. And you know these happen in uh, liberal arts colleges and freshman seminars. <laughs> But they're they're hard to pull off in a classroom. They certainly can be pulled off in a classroom, but you have to teach students to to get there. Um, so there's all sorts of strategies: structured academic controversy, Socratic seminars, uh, activities called philosophical chairs. I'm a big fan of strategies put out by Harvard's Project Zero and the Making Thinking Visible. Uh, there's a book called Making Thinking Visible, which is all sorts of structured activities that engage students in thinking and talking with one another. Um, and so I think what one thing that the field of civic education needs to do is really help prepare teachers to use these strategies. Um, because what a lot of teachers, when they, they avoid discussion because they're worried that things are going to go off the rails. Someone's going to say something. I don't know how to respond. This is like it's going to go out. Of, it's going to get out of control. But these structured activities create uh, moments where you're required to talk, where you're required to listen, where you're required to consult documents, where you hold back your opinion and present opinion you don't necessarily agree with. And so there's all these ways in which we're teaching young people to discuss um, and that we provide the material so you don't know you know you have a good sense of what reasons are going to be coming into the room because you've prepared students with the content and background for particular issues so that was a long answer but it's a it's complicated I think that you know just to summarize that that we a discussion is not a teacher throws out one question that just popped into their head um, in response to, you know, like January 6th happened what do you all think like that's not going to lead to a good discussion <laughs> so you need to make sure that people are prepared, that you know where you want that discussion to go, you understand how people are gonna discuss, students understand how they're gonna discuss. So there's a lot of, um, just like you can't, you, we need to teach writing and we scaffold the teaching of writing, uh, you need to scaffold the, the creation of discussion as well. Thank you for that. Um, one thing uh, that came to mind when you mentioned that was um, kind of, the idea of teaching through questions, tasks, and sources, um, and within those tasks, fostering uh, scaffolded uh, methods for students to have um, good discussions within that. You mentioned um, structured academic controversy, philosophical chairs, etc. One thing that we've been trying to do in Albemarle County Schools and in collaboration with Charlottesville City Schools and actually seven school divisions from around the state, um, including Fairfax and uh, Virginia Beach and others is to develop these uh, things that are called inquiries. So students, and you all probably have experience with that um, through C3 teachers, et cetera, but students are having to consider compelling questions where there's no one answer to the question. Um, and they're really constructing their own knowledge and understandings by diving into sources that support that compelling question. Um, and within those, those um, inquiry-based lessons and conversations, we're seeing a lot of really rich student discussion. I went into um, a class the other day, a middle school class, civics class, and the teacher had these awesome stems up on the, the wall that students were referring to. So during these conversations, um, so that they don't go off the rails, um, teachers are, are teaching students how to um, use stems and phrases like, I heard Alan say this, um, I agree with this part, but has, have you considered this? So students are referring to those kind of discussion um, stems and structures as they um, engage in those conversations. And I love what you said about like providing that structure for students, providing um, procedures, methods, pedagogies that allow students to engage in rich conversations that scaffold them towards having those conversations. You did mention um, 
you know, that there's a lot of fear that conversations like that will go off the rails, and sometimes they do. Um, what's your uh, advice for teachers for when those moments do happen? What if the conversation does go off the rails? How can teachers respond to that in the moment with students? Yeah, I mean, these are hard. It so much depends on what that what went off the rails. Did someone say something just deeply offensive that violated the classroom norms? Did someone say something that was not offensive, but nevertheless caused hurt? Um, you know, so uh, imagine a, someone making a strong statement against um, immigrants being in the country um, while there are first generation students in the classroom, right? So it's, you can't, you can have your opinion about immigration, but you nevertheless can hurt someone who feel, you know, who is an immigrant. And so these are uh, tough moments. And, you know, so um, one thing that I, I'll just repeat that, that the structures often provide a, a little, they provide structure for the teacher also. So that it kind of helps that there, there are norms embedded within these structures. Nevertheless, I think a lot of teachers want to imagine I can, I can pick the question and design the strategy and design the activity in such a way that no one's feelings going to get hurt and it's never going to go sideways. And that's, I think you just have to let go of that wish and say, that's, I'm not going to think about that way. What I'm going to think about it is I'm going to do my best to imagine what might happen that I wouldn't know what to do with. What, what view might come in um, that, that I don't want in this class or that we need to unpack or challenge. Um, and so have some, you know, I play out scenarios in my head whenever I'm designing materials for discussion. Um, and then you can, so, so I can think in advance, okay, so how might I design the materials or the background preparation so that we sort of channel that uh, sort of what might be an offensive view or we think help students think in advance, how do you keep in mind who you're talking to? Um, and then being able to have the norms and the, and, and the structures within your classroom so that if someone says something and it's starting to get too heated, you can sort of stop and say, let's remind ourselves um, about what we agreed to right now. And then you can do things also. It's not easy, these moments. And sometimes you need a moment to think. Um, and so it's perfectly fine to say, you know what, um, I'd like us all to like do it, like if you're in a kind of a larger group and say, let's all do a turn and talk right now on and uh, about this particular issue and kind of redirect the conversation and turn it back so that everyone can kind of process for a second and you can process for a second and then come back. And then in the political classroom, um, I thought this teacher that had a really nice moment, uh, Mr. Kushner that we describe, who was having a discussion about affirmative action with high school seniors in a non-tracked classroom. And so there was, it was, there was some um, racial and ethnic diversity in the room and that it, it did start going sideways. It started turning into the white students talking about us and those students, and it just didn't quite sit right. And, and, and a student was being, was visibly being emotionally, uh, an African-American student emotionally affected. Um, and so it was the last, you know, we, there were 10 more minutes left in class and he made the smart, the smart decision to say, okay, we're going to stop the discussion there. He didn't call attention to the student that he noticed that was feeling uncomfortable. Let's write at, and just gave them, let's 10 minutes to write out where you're thinking of, is on this question right now. And so sort of created in the moment an exit ticket kind of uh, approach to that discussion. Then found that student later in the day, checked in with her, and then opened the next day with, I want to tell you what I noticed in this discussion yesterday. And I want us to talk about why this was hurtful and why we need to watch the way we say things um, when we're talking about issues of race. And I, you know, one thing I, when I was a student teacher, my cooperating teacher once said to me, you know, um, teaching's like being a baseball player. So some days you hit a single, some days you hit a home run and sometimes you strike out. And, but the beauty of this job is that you're at bat the next day. And so you can always recover, you know, you always have a, another moment to sort of process and address something that that maybe had been hurtful or what you know, in some ways had had a 
an issue that you want to discuss. And in fact, talking about discussion itself is a great way to improve discussion in the classroom and to say, so was this a good discussion? What should we work on next time? How can we uh, be more attentive to each other in the next discussion and sort of help students um, see, see, you know, become better at this skill? Absolutely. And uh, I, the things you mentioned, like, you know, a quick turn and talk, having students journal, things like that, when discussions get heated, I think are great things for teachers to have in their back pockets just to be able to turn to at any time. Another thing um, I saw a teacher use, we had actually in our school division been trained in Glenn Singleton's um, Courageous Conversations About Race Protocol. Um, and I actually saw a teacher using this, uh, this um, structure from Glenn Singleton's um, training about the compass points. So like there's an idea that people enter into kind of controversial conversations at different places on this compass. So you might be entering, based on your lived experiences, you might be entering in the emotional space. But another mm -hmm. person might be entering the conversation more from a, a justice-oriented space and another person from an intellectual space. And sometimes um, there's four different ways you can enter the conversation. And sometimes um, students who are entering, and even adults, from an emotional space might c come into conflict with people who are entering from more of a philosophical, theoretical space because they don't have that same lived experience with having experienced bias or racism themselves. Um, and so just making, I saw a teacher uh, having students explore the four compass points and talk about where they were entering the conversation and from what space they were entering the conversation. And I thought that was a really cool way of sort of creating a third space for students because if they, if I'm entering from the intellectual space and, and my peer is entering from the emotional space and I've you know, inadvertently offended my, my, my peer with the way I'm talking about this issue. It just helps students be more aware of that so that they can take a pause and really understand from another student's perspective why that reaction may be occurring. So I thought it was a cool way to, um, to bring that, that notion into discussions in the classroom. And um, so returning back to the original threads, two threads you mentioned, Dr. McAvoy, you talked about discussions in a democratic classroom, and then you talked about citizenship and um, instilling those uh, skills in students that allow them to be engaged citizens, take informed action, um, and things of that nature. What are the best ways teachers can create opportunities for authentic citizenship in a civics classroom or government classroom. Yeah, so you mentioned the C3 framework and the and inquiry and that off, you know the the last part of the inquiry arc is to is something called uh, it taking informed action, I think. And um this is the hard I think it's the hardest it's definitely the hardest part of the arc. It's hard practically for teachers to feel, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get students um, out in the community doing something, identifying a problem, et cetera. But so like, so we can think of taking informed action maybe along a continuum or what you're calling authentic civic experiences. So on like the richest, deepest uh, part of the continuum is that is civics classes that have students identify a problem in their community that they really care about they research the problem uh, and do background. They identify stakeholders in the community who are involved with it and maybe interview them. Um, and then they find um, you know, where in the community they could put the, share their voice. So if it was a school issue, perhaps they could um, get on the agenda at the school board meeting. If it was a city issue, they could um, make, make a meeting with the mayor or write a letter or do, you know, or do a media campaign or something like that. So that's like really high level A plus work <laughs> on the part of the teacher. To, but that takes, a, it's hard to orchestrate. As a teacher, you might have, you know, 100 students a day and a lot of projects and, you know, that, that you know, it certainly can be done, but it's, that's a high bar. Um, but then there's um, ways in which you can have, so what you're looking for in these sort of civic engagement experiences is taking learning outside of the classroom in some way and engaging students in some, in some way in um, taking their thoughts and ideas and expressing them elsewhere. So I'll just tell you briefly the story of a couple of teachers here in the Raleigh area that inspired me 
And they were inspired by one teacher who was a civics teacher. They went to the national conference um, and a teacher had shared the, a project in which he had um, students in a civics classroom just make kind of make a date with uh, an, an adult or someone a little older than them um, who you know could have been a grandparent, a neighbor, your boss at the wherever you're working, and sit down and you know make a list of sort of the issues that you care about or you're curious about, and then sit down with that person and have a meal or a coffee or a bagel or whatever, um, and talk and just have a have a real conversation with somebody outside of your classroom about the issues you care about, listen to what they have to say, how do they interpret that, blah, 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 and then they write, and then they had to like come back and share the experience with the class. And he called that, I think dinner, that was the dinner with democracy was the idea. Um, and so uh, two teachers that I know heard about that and they were both middle school teachers and they said, oh, we, we, can, we can take this idea and run with it. And so they had their classes uh, create dinner with democracy as a school event, and so they invited parents and community and the and the and the students to have an evening, like in the multi-purpose room at the school. They brought potlucks. Uh, the students had designed a series of questions that they cared about, um, and then they you would sit at a table. I went to the event one year. You sit at a table with parents and young people, middle schoolers, their family, and whatever. Uh, and there'd be, you know, you'd have 15 minutes of conversation at the table and they had like a table, a conversation starter about a political issue. Then you would go have, go back to the buffet and come back to sit at a new table and you would talk again. So there were about three rounds of um, conversation. And it was nice for parents and students to have this sort of structured ability to talk about some political issues. And I think parents learned that young people are curious and interested in these things and that they have opinions and ideas. And young people learned that adults can listen to them or are interested in what they have to say. And it was nice, it was a nice event. So we at North Carolina State have taken that and it's become a regular part of my social studies methods class now is that, and it's happening this coming Thursday, we called it uh, Dining with Democracy, where we have a big campus-wide public event on camp. Um, in which my students facilitate um, small group, small table conversations around a couple of political issues. Um, so we kind of launch the issue at the event and then they, the people are in 30 minutes of conversation and then we launch a new issue in 30 minutes of conversation. So this is all this to say, like there's ways that one just simple thing that you can do is have students talk to people outside of their classroom um, and and practice that and in a way that's about genuine listening and trying to understand one another and so it's not go debate some go debate your cousin or your bot but it's how do you just try to understand their perspective um, and these sorts of things are kind of magical honestly like people you don't they off so many people don't get asked their opinion. They don't get a chance to sort of feel heard and 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 engage in in an authentic way with others. And I think, you know, this is a huge problem in the United States right now is how much animosity we feel towards people who disagree with us. And what you learn when you talk is that people are not that far apart, um, and they want they do actually want to live happily with their <laughs> with their neighbors and. Um, and so I think this is just, you know, it's a simple way. You could do that within a school community and just have students and the 12th graders talking to the ninth graders or, you know, like there's just uh, a lot of ways you can make uh, that these sort of are community building moments for young people. That's great. It reminds me of what uh, UVA is uh, doing with One Small Step. Um, there's a One Small Step program that they're doing with StoryCorps where you get mm. people together who ha are from different ends of the political spectrum around issues and just have them have a conversation. Typically they come closer together than you imagined um, before they set out to have the conversation. But we're, we've actually been trying to explore uh, bringing them into some of our K-12 schools. Um, and we're actually exploring doing that with families and um, with students. So it just, it reminds me of that, just that simple act of having a conversation with somebody who you disagree with and you can talk about the issues that are important to you, they can talk about the issues that are important to them, you acknowledge and validate and just have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to uh, make sure that we opened it up um, for our audience members, our fellows and audience members to ask questions of 
of Dr. McAvoy and myself. Um, so how long do we have for this, Mark? About 10 minutes or so? Okay, so any questions you all have, feel free to, uh, to ask. Any advice for trying to overcome uh, with students their, the preponderance of bad examples of how to have a discussion that they've seen in the media, you know, watching cable television news or, and I guess also like, you know, I was kind of was amused, uh, chuckled a bit when you're talking about the, the meals thing, which I thought was a, a brilliant idea, but then I'm thinking of the stereotypical uncle at Thanksgiving <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, how do you, because, you know, the, the students are often bombarded with, you know, these, what passes as political media where it's just, where shouting someone down is considered victory in the, the so-called so discourse. How do you, it, it's swimming, it, you know, what you're, I think what you're suggesting is great and we need to do it, but it is going to be swimming against the stream, I think, in yes. a lot of ways. Yeah, and in fact, a lot of the teachers that we spoke to for the book, The Political Classroom, and, uh, and in general today, is that they were, you know, teachers who do this well are explicitly trying to say, what you see in the media is not what we're doing in this classroom, <laughs> and we're trying to do something else. And so the way strategies you can use to uh, build that concept for students is, you know, you can watch video clips of good discussion um, and show them there's Diana Hess, who was the co-author of the book, had in a previous study studied a teacher who would, you know, did a lot of scaffolding towards having high quality discussions in the classroom. And then at the end of the year would videotape the class at the end of the semester, say a video that taped the class having a really good discussion and then show that video to the next class and say, this is what we're working toward. And so that, they, and what do you notice in this discussion? Um, and what are the students doing? What are the skills that they're, and so having them sort of tease apart a good discussion, um, you know, and you can do the opposite too, is sh of showing a bad discussion and saying, what's going wrong in this discussion? And, or what, you know, what are the, what do we want to avoid? How do we, how would we avoid having this discussion? And so this is sort of the idea of making explicit the norms of discussion to students. Um, and, you know, that, that Neely just mentioned, like the uh, sentence starters and other structures that help people, you know, how do you disagree? I like the, the I, I also teach sentence starters and one is um, what I heard you say was blank. And the reason I disagree is blank, uh, or I, I'd like to add, or, you know, and so these sorts of things are helping students overcome that. Um, and I think, you know, I also, during the last uh, presidential election, got asked to talk a lot and said, I think that helping students understand that campaign talk and classroom talk are different talks. And so in a campaign, you actually can call names and be sort of rude to one another if, if you choose to do. We don't do that in the classroom. That academic talk or classroom talk is a higher and harder level of talk. And I'm going to help, we're going to help get there. Um, but to the point of having, you know, we've done the dining with democracy thing now for, we're do, about to do our fourth time. And it's amazing that when I think when people are face to face with someone, they, they behave, they, they, for the most part, I mean, A, you're probably not going to show up to this event if you really want to be, um, a, a real jerk, but if you, uh, but when you're face to face with someone and, you know, Neely just mentioned this very nice strategy of where, like this, uh, how are you, are you feeling a lot about this issue or do you approach this sort of more from an intellectual? So we do a, a share around before we do discussions, which sort of uh, gives it without using that little same structure, it gives people the opportunity to express whether or not you feel personally affected by this issue. And knowing that is just hugely valuable <laughs> to helping people feel kindness towards one another. And so if you, if you know that, if you wanna talk about homelessness, for example, and you know that someone has experienced home housing insecurity, you speak differently when you know that. And so um, these, this is an, it's an important 
sort of, again, when I talked about scaffolding and structuring discussion, you design for, let's start with this moment before we get into the, um, so what should we do question, which is what we're looking at. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but there's a, there, there are ways to, to design for um, better discussion, but you are absolutely right. You are working, it's a very important for teachers to recognize students in their own home have maybe seen really terrible political discussions, like knock down, drag out, terrible, we don't speak to each other because of the, la the way you voted in the last election. And so when you then, when they show up in your classroom, like, hey, let's have a political discussion, what they have in their mind is that these things go very badly and I don't want to participate. So you do need to nurture. That's why you have to you know, nurture and structure, show them that you can present them with a better way. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, um, I have a question about the word citizenship. Um, the school mm -hmm. I work in has a huge um, immigrant population and, you know, citizenship is a very sensitive topic. So in thinking about your dinners, dining with democracy idea, I was thinking that perhaps it would be good to hold it within the school since a common experience everyone has is being at our school together mm -hmm. um, and maybe even discussing teachers and students, what is our experience and community building, which is something I've thought about a lot since we've come back from COVID um, and just want to pretend everything is normal again without doing the work of community building to you know, make people feel like they have a stake in how things go in the building. Do you have any thoughts about either one of those things as far as is community better member a better term than citizenship or community membership um, or any thoughts you have about that? Yeah, that, I, I, tend to, I tend to talk about democratic education, not citizenship education or political education, not citizenship education. And you know, for those reasons that regardless of your immigration status, you are a community member in and and policies affect you. And so these are the and discussion is a way to so that students can hear from one another how they're differently affected by policy. I think if you have a sort of multinational school community, what a great opportunity to have people not maybe put immigration on the table directly, <laughs> you know, um, but to, you know, to a question like, um, you know, that's maybe more gets through, I'm, I'll just, I haven't quite thought this one through yet, but like, let's say, should the United States increase its refugee numbers or something like that. Um, but opening then with a share out question of how do you experience living in the United States or something like that, you know, just a real open or uh, what's something we used, we've used, what's something you value about living in the United States, which is like some a sort of like a put, let's put some warmness in the room <laughs> before uh, and see each other as hu humans first and, um, and then policy imaginers second. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, opportunity. So there's a difference, I think also I'll just throw out here between dialogue and deliberation and debate. And so one thing that communities need is dialogue, which is, do we understand how we all differently experience the same school or the same community or what? Um, and, and that it's not about argumentation. It's not about persuasion. It's about listening and empathetically understanding. Um, Deliberation is what we I sort of promote in a lot of the strategies I mentioned, which is about the we the core question: How should we live together? So it's about coming. It's about understanding an issue that impacts us all, and can we come up with an idea that is sort of attentive to all of our concerns? And so it's often you sort of are trying to lead students towards consensus or some uh, at least agreed upon sort of that we could all agree with this kind of idea even if it's not the exact same policy issue. And then debate is, you know, that's about critical thinking and persuasion and argumentation. Uh, and it's not bad, but um, but we just need to be careful about which issues we bring up for debate. Are you trying to exacerbate differences? I've been doing a study with the Close Up program um, in which we're finding that when you ask students to deliberate and come to consensus, students' opinions start moving together. And when you ask students to debate pre-post, you've created more polarization in the classroom. So you have to be careful um, 
when and with what issues you want to engage students in debate, I would say, especially in our hyper-polarized context. Um, I've really appreciated that response, and I really appreciate your question. Um, that's something that's come up in our school division as well, just with the, the term citizen, citizen or citizenship. I think we've reframed our conceptualization of citizenship to really mean justice-oriented citizenship. So whether you are officially a citizen or not, um, the idea that we are, are in this to create a more just future for all people. And so that coming at citizenship from that particular perspective, I think helps to um, not make it like a in and out sort of situation or further marginalize students who um, may be undocumented or their families may be undocumented. But I appreciate you thinking about that because it's very important to use inclusive terminology. And I like um, that Dr. McAvoy mentioned um, just democratic education um, as a term that she could use. And, and the idea of community members and creating community is really uh, beneficial. I, can right. I just add, I also, I think it's important for teachers, like. For Native American students, citizenship citizenship landed on them, and so and and have a multinational view of citizenship. I see myself as a member of uh, a particular Native American uh, nation first, perhaps, uh, and or I see it blended with U.S. citizenship. So we have to just be. It is. You're right. A loaded, a loaded term. For sure, and I think we are running uh, short on time. But I wanted to ask you. Um, one more uh, question, Dr. McAvoy, which is we've talked a lot about um, taking informed action. We've talked about creating a democratic classroom, ideas for navigating a hyper-polarized environment. Um, we didn't get into uh, something that I thought we might talk about, which was uh, should, like, is neutrality possible? Can We know it probably isn't possible and not ideal um, because there's racism and anti-racism and et cetera. Um, but the idea of whether teachers should bring their partisan political viewpoints into the classroom and things like that. We didn't go there, but I knew that we had planned to maybe talk about that. But outside of, of any of those topics, and just given uh, your vantage point, um, working with teachers who are preparing to teach K-12 social studies, is there anything that we're not considering that we should be considering? Is there anything we're missing, any trends or trajectories that we should be thinking about? as we move forward in this environment? Yeah, I think, well, related to the first part of your question of this idea of neutrality and the, the wish that one could have neutrality, just to say straightforwardly, if you design an institution called schools and compel people to send their children to schools, and that one purpose of that institution is to maintain, help pr maintain democratic society, it's not neutral. Right, you have it. You have a, a clear mission <laughs> that we're trying. It doesn't mean you punish students for not saying I'd rather live in some other type of society. But you know, the schools ought to be designed and cultivating moments for people to um, practice the, the building of, demo of democracy. Um, and so that, in and out of itself, is not neutral. But what people are talking about is neutral as usually controversial issues. So should we be neutral to the issues we bring in the classroom? Um, and and it's true that's you know maybe we we could aspire toward neutrality or but I think maybe setting aside the word neutral, and just aiming for fairness and to say I want to be fair, I want a classroom that feels fair to all the students and that they have room for their own voice and that they're um, they're respected as human beings regardless of the positions they hold, um, and that we're going to design it to work together on issues. So fairness, we can aspire. I think that's a, a, a perfectly reasonable thing to aspire to. <laughs> um, some people say we can't be neutral. Therefore, therefore, I should be transparently partisan, and I don't. I don't agree with that. I think that we can still um, that we should we should aspire to be fair in the classroom with the, when we introduce issues. Thank you. Well, I appreciated this conversation. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, and. Uh, Thanks for your wonderful questions to our audience members as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, the rest of your day sounds fantastic, so I think that I, I hope you all enjoy it.